Good morning, everyone. Today, we are going to be looking at chapter 10 of Paul's letter to the church in Rome. Paul's message in Romans from beginning to end concerns the good news of a righteousness that is by faith. I am not ashamed of the gospel, Paul wrote in Romans 1, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Paul wrote that the gospel brought salvation first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. He declared his anguish for his Jewish brothers and sisters at the beginning of Romans chapter 9, saying that he wished he could do something to save them. Even if it meant he himself was cut off from Christ on their behalf, if only they would believe and be saved. He says again in Romans chapter 10, verse 1, that his heart's desire is that the Israelites may be saved. But, he says in verse 3, they did not know the righteousness of God and sought to establish their own. They did not submit to God's righteousness, a righteousness that is by faith. Paul says in verse 4 that Christ is the culmination. Other translations say that Christ is the goal, the end, the fulfillment of the law as righteousness. Through faith in Christ, there, be, there may be righteousness by faith for everyone who believes. Christ perfectly fulfilled the law. Then he gave his life to pay the penalty that we deserved for breaking the law. His righteousness becomes our righteousness. All we have to do is accept it. That's the good news. In the following section of chapter 10, Paul quotes freely from the Old Testament. Let's read it. Chapter 10, Romans chapter 10, starting at verse 5. Moses writes this about the righteousness that is by the law. The person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that is by faith says... Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the deep, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you, are, you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame, for there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Here, says theologian N.T. Wright, Paul has scampered through a fascinating train of thought, like a piece of music being played at speed. Let's slow it down a bit and listen more closely. Paul's first quote in verse 5 comes from Leviticus chapter 18, verse 5. And it's a section of Leviticus that gives God's instructions to his people for how they should live in the promised land. They are to obey God's laws, Moses says, because the person who does these things will live by them. But Moses also wrote about righteousness by faith. In the next verses, Paul recalls phrases from Deuteronomy chapter 30. I've already told you that I love these cross-references, and I found this one particularly interesting. Plus, I have a special place in my heart for the book of Deuteronomy after studying it with a group of women in Athens. So we're going to dig into this for a minute. Deuteronomy is the fifth book of the Old Testament. In its first verse, we are told that the, these are the words Moses spoke to all Israel in the wilderness east of the Jordan. The people of Israel were about to enter the promised land. Moses would not be going with them. So these were his final words to them. The title of the book, Deuteronomy, comes from the Greek, Deuteronomio, which means second law. It is not another law, but a statement and reaffirm, a restatement and reaffirmation of the law given to the people at Mount Sinai. 
Deuteronomy is quoted more than 80 times in the New Testament, an indication of this book's importance for the first Christians. A great theme of the book of Deuteronomy is the choice set before the Israelites as they stand ready to enter the promised land. Remember, obey, and find blessings, or forget, and be cursed and cut off with consequences for their disobedience, including exile. In Deuteronomy 28 and 29, Moses predicts that Israel will disobey. They will incur the curses as consequence. They will be driven out of the promised land and sent off into exile. But then, in Deuteronomy chapter 30, Moses encourages the people with future hope, a message filled with promise and life. God promises that he will rescue his people. But how would this be? What would it look like? The Jews of Paul's day would have studied this passage carefully and puzzled over it. They were hoping to find out what God was going to do for them after all the years they had suffered at the hands of pagan nations, believing that they were still suffering the consequences of Deuteronomy 29. They wanted to know how theirs could be the generation that would see Israel restored to her former glory, rescued from foreign rulers. Let's look at Deuteronomy 30, starting at verse 1. When all these blessings and curses I have set before you come on you, and you take them to heart wherever the Lord your God disperses you among the nations, and when you and your children return to the Lord your God and obey him with all your heart, and with all your soul, <clears throat> according to everything I have commanded you today, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where he scattered you. Even if you have been banished to the most distant lands under the heavens, from there the Lord your God will gather you and bring you back. He will bring you to the land that belonged to your ancestors and you will take possession of it. He will make you more prosperous and numerous than your ancestors. <coughs> the Lord your God will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your descendants so that you may love him with all your heart and with all your soul and live. God promises his people that if they turn back to him, even while they are in exile, he will rescue and restore them. Even more, he promises to transform them to change their hearts so that they can love him fully. Paul used the same image, circumcision of the heart, in Romans 2.29. Moses goes on in Deuteronomy 30 to speak of God's word being very near his people, in your mouth and in your heart, starting at verse 11. Now, I am, now what I am commanding you today is not too difficult for you or beyond your reach. It is not up in heaven so that you have to ask who will ascend into heaven to get it and proclaim it to us so that we may obey it. Nor is it beyond the sea so that you have to ask who will cross the sea to get it and proclaim it to us so that we may obey it. No, the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so you may obey it. In other words, the people knew what they had to do to please God. The message was as near as their own hearts and mouths. No one would have to go up to heaven or cross the sea to get it so that they would know what God expected of them. Let's look back now at Romans 10, verses 6 through 9. But the righteousness that is by faith says, Do not say in your heart, Who will ascend into heaven? that is, to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the deep, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So Paul has taken an essentially Old Testament doctrine of salvation, and shown that it has been fulfilled in Jesus, the Messiah. Israel has been longing for salvation. In Jesus Christ, God has now provided the way 
for Israel to return, to be transformed, to be saved. You do not have to go up into heaven because the Messiah has already come down to you. You do not have to go down into the depths because the Messiah has already been raised from the dead. The promises which spoke of the final undoing of the curse have come true in Jesus. Christ has provided our salvation through his incarnation. Christ came down. And through his resurrection, Christ was raised from the dead. What about you? Maybe you are longing for salvation. Maybe you are struggling to find your own way to figure out righteousness for yourself. Paul says in verse 8 that God's salvation is right in front of us. The answer is as near as your own heart, your own mouth. This is the gospel message in a nutshell. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's all you have to do. Believe and confess. For some of us, our transformation in Christ was dramatic. We were living far away from God, and he rescued us from darkness into his kingdom of light. Others of us grew up with Christian parents, and we can't remember a time when Jesus wasn't part of our lives. Dramatic or not, those of us who are in Christ each have a story of when we chose to believe and confessed Jesus as Lord of our lives. I am blessed to have grown up in a Christian home where I was taught the truth about Jesus for as long as I can remember. And we were part of a strong church family right here at Western Springs Baptist Church. One Sunday afternoon when I was about seven years old, I was riding in the car with my mom. I remember looking up at the tree branches hanging over the road and thinking about the sermon I'd heard at church that morning, preached by Art Brown, who some of you will remember. I don't recall exactly what the pastor said, but that day everything clicked in my brain. I understood that Jesus loved me and that to be one of his children, I had to ask him to come live in my heart. And so I did. It wasn't until about five years later that I began to comprehend that if he was going to live in my heart, that meant he was going to be Lord of my life too. When I was 12 years old, my mom's father passed away. When I picture what a godly man looks like, he's one of the first people I think of, my grandfather. I was talking with my uncle this week, and he said that even though his dad's been gone for over 35 years, he still finds himself wishing he could call him up on the phone and ask for his advice. My grandpa's life made an impression on all of us. The last words he ever said to me were, promise me you'll never forget Jesus. And I promised watching what was important to him even when he couldn't remember anything else, and then hearing people share at his funeral, funeral about he, how he had impacted them, I saw what a life lived in obedience to God could be. I knew then that I wanted God to take control of my life. I wanted to live a life like my grandfather had lived. I went to Wheaton College, and in my second year there was a student revival. At the end of that week, I stepped up with hundreds of my classmates to express my feeling that God was calling me into full-time ministry. But I didn't know what that would look like. I was a music student, so I thought maybe God could use music to open doors to share the good news. I just kept praying for God to show me what he wanted me to do. By the spring of my senior year, I thought I had a pretty good idea. I had a plan. But piece by piece, it all fell apart. Then a friend asked me to join her in short-term missions after graduation, and I thought, why not? We eventually chose to go to Athens to join a team working in refugee ministry there. My plan was to go for two years and then return to ministry in the city of Chicago. But God had other plans. After my first year in Athens, I felt God wanted me to stay and continue the work he had led me to there. I ended up living in Greece for almost 25 years sharing the good news with Muslim refugees. We had an amazing opportunity to share the gospel with people who had never heard it before and to demonstrate how much God loves them 
by helping them in practical ways. I met my husband, Ilir, in Athens. We were teammates serving refugees together. We were married here in the year 2000 by another pastor many of you will remember, John Bukema. After we were married, Ilir and I spent years struggling to have children, turning to God for comfort in the midst of that heartache. God finally blessed us with the birth of our son, Matthew, who is now 14 years old. Our daughter, Anna, is 13. Anna wanted me to make sure to tell you that she's the real blessing, though, and not Matthew. <laughs> Again, we had to trust God and rely on him for strength and wisdom. We praise the Lord for his faithfulness and provision. And now we're living here. I'm an only child, and we moved back to help my parents at the end of last year. It has not been an easy year. My mom passed away in July. I thank God that we were here to be with her in the final months of her earthly life. Only God knows what the coming years will hold for us. We are walking by faith that the God who has carried us this far isn't done with us yet. Through all of my experiences, I feel like God keeps reinforcing this lesson, that I need to trust him that I can trust him. Of course, over the years, I have struggled with giving the Lord control and not taking back control for myself. I've stopped listening for what he wanted me to do, and I have trusted my own judgment instead. When I was worried about my future, I asked him to direct my path, and he did. But then I worried about who I would marry, if I would ever have children, if my children would be okay, now I worry about my husband and how he will feel living in this country that is so foreign to him. Again and again, I have had to learn to put my trust in the Lord. What did we ask ourselves the other week? Do we have the faith of Abraham? As I challenged you, I have to remind myself to look in love and gratitude and trust to the creator God who promises impossible things and brings them to pass. I've been thankful for this study of Romans, to remember how much God loves us, to reflect on who I am in Christ, because even after all the ways God has proved himself faithful, I still struggle to skip the worrying and go straight to prayer, to remember that he's in control and we can trust things into his hands, to wait and watch and be ready to take hold of the opportunities God brings, because our God is good. He is faithful. That's my story. What about you? Have you put your faith in Christ? If you have, you can live in confidence. As Roman eight de Romans 8 declares, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. You are justified by faith. You have been set free. That's not to say you won't mess up. Paul makes it very clear in Romans 7 that while we live in these bodies, we will continue to struggle with sin. It's where you go from there that makes the difference. We need to recognize our shortcomings and be convicted. But conviction is the Holy Spirit moving in your heart to propel you towards him, towards living in his will by his power at work in you. It is a call to surrender and ultimately to victory and joy. So many times in my life, I have held on to my shame and regret. I've allowed the king of lies to whisper in my ear, telling me I'm a failure. I'll never be good enough. I'll never do anything right. I've carried my shame and allowed it to take root inside of me. Instead of turning inward in our failure, we need to turn to God to ask him for help. If you have trusted in Christ, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit. With the Spirit of God living in you, you have life and peace. You are a child of God. You have been adopted. You are an heir with Christ who shares in his glory. But maybe you're here and you haven't yet put your hope in Christ. Maybe you're ready to trust in Jesus but feel like you don't know what to do. You're asking in your heart, what do I have to do to be saved? As I said at the beginning of 
the lesson today, Paul's message in Romans from beginning to end concerns the good news of a righteousness that is by faith. We can walk through Romans and find the message of salvation stated in a way that is simple, clear, and amazing at the same time. In the first chapters of Romans, Paul describes how we are all sinners. And in Romans 3.23, he writes, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Because of our sin, we have earned judgment from God and have been condemned to die. For the wages of sin is death, we read in Romans 6.23. There is nothing we can do on our own to make ourselves right with God. But because of his great love for us, God became a human being in the person of Jesus Christ. He was crucified. He died in our place. He took the burden and judgment of our sin upon himself. Romans 3.25 tells us that God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood. Then Jesus rose from the dead. He conquered sin and death. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification, says Romans 4.25. As a result of Jesus' sacrifice, God offers us salvation as a gift. Romans 6.23 says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Salvation is gained by receiving the gift God offers, by believing in your heart that all of this is true. What do we have to do to be saved? Paul answered the question clearly in Romans 10, 9 and 10. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Notice that there is no reference to works or rituals or certain words to recite. People think salvation must be a complicated process, but it is not. Paul talked about this at the end of Romans 9. Some people, he said, will stumble over Christ because salvation by faith doesn't make sense to them. It sounds too easy. It seems more reasonable to us that we ought to pursue righteousness by our good works. But Paul explained that God's plan is not for those who try to earn his favor by their good works. It is for those who realize that they can never be good enough and so must depend on Christ. Only by putting our faith in what Jesus Christ has done will we be saved. Let's read it again, Romans 10, 9 and 10. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess and are saved. The point of decision is between you and God to believe in your heart. But the the point of declaring with your mouth implies another person. I hope that if you have believed today for the first time, you'll tell someone. You can tell me, your small group leader, your small group, another friend here. Tell somebody. There might also be someone here who isn't ready to make a decision about Jesus yet. The very fact that you're here tells me that you're searching for God and for the truth. The Bible promises that those who seek God will find him. I encourage you, if you want to know God but feel like you can't find the way, ask God to show you the truth. Just ask Watch him show up. Looking back at our text for today, in Romans 10, verse 11, Paul again quotes from Isaiah 28, 16. This is the same verse he quoted at the end of Romans 9, at the end of Romans 9, in verse 33, where he combined it with phrases from Isaiah 8, 14. See, 
I lay in Zion a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. In saying that we will never be put to shame, Paul is not saying that once we believe in Christ, our lives will be easy, that we will never face disappointment. Paul is saying that God will keep his end of the bargain. Those who call on him will be saved. He will never fail to provide righteousness to those who believe. Paul's final quotation of the Hebrew scriptures is from Joel 2.32 and serves as his conclusion to this section while neatly laying the foundation for the following section. If everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, then everyone must hear the message. How can people call on God for salvation, after all, if they have not believed? And how can they believe if they have not heard the message? Let's look at Romans 10, 14 and 15. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching it to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. All believers are sent to announce the good news. The process of salvation begins when one person tells another the good news. There can be no hearing, no belief, unless someone communicates the truth. In chapter 9, Paul speaks of his great sorrow that so many Jews were rejecting the good news. Paul's agony was so intense that he was willing to be cursed and cut off from Christ if by doing so his brother and sister Israelites could be saved. God has given you friends and loved ones that he wants to reach through you. Can you have some of the same love, concern, and compassion that Paul had for his Jewish brothers and sisters? One way you can open the doors to share your faith with others is through demonstration. You can share your love and kindness with your neighbors and co-workers. As you go through difficult times, those around you will see how you put your faith in Christ. Actions very often speak louder than words, right? But eventually, someone will have to explain the what and the how of the gospel. Just as I spelled it out for you this morning, going through the book of Romans. Both demonstration and proclamation should be used in sharing the gospel. There's lots of helpful tools to know. You don't have to come up with the words by yourself. There's lots of helpful tools, like a little tract like this that you can keep in your purse, or little things that can remind you. Even Alice made these for us that kind of walks through the verses of Romans that I shared with you this morning. There's lots of tools already out there that you can use to know what words to say, but... We need to know the good news so we can tell it to others. I want to ask, I want all of us to ask ourselves this morning, do others know of my faith by my actions? To whom can you communicate the life-changing message of Christ? Think of someone in your life who needs to hear the good news. Now start thinking about something you can do to help that person hear it. My husband is gifted at this. He can talk to anybody about Jesus. It does not come so easily for me. But I have found that when I'm mindful, when I pay attention, God provides opportunities to turn the conversation, even just to ask a question. Do you know, by the way, that Jesus asked far more questions than he ever answered. People have counted, and according to the Gospels, Jesus asked more than 300 different questions during his life and ministry. By contrast, he only directly answered a handful of the questions he was asked. You don't need to have all the answers to share the Gospel. Questions can be an invitation to further reflection and ultimately to transformation. Personally, I have found freedom in that. We're not held responsible for how others respond, but we are expected to share the good news 
as God opens doors for us. Pray for and keep your eyes open for those opportunities. How beautiful are the feet of him who bring good news. May your feet be beautiful because they represent your willingness to be sent out into the world with the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ. Amen.